Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and today, in this most festival of times, I wanted to do another round of holiday physics. Now last time I did this, we talked about the incredible and underappreciated role that ice plays in making life on our planet possible. But this time, I want to talk about something simpler. How, to this day, after centuries, we still don't really understand at a physics level how ice skating works. Now right away, I bet many of you think they do know how ice skating works. You see, by having the full weight of a human being supported on two little blades, you have a whole lot of force being applied over a very small surface area. In other words, the pressure under the blades is very, very high. And thus, even if water should be frozen at the ambient temperature, at high pressures, it can pressure melt. And thus, our skates create a thin sheet of liquid water that lubricates your skates and allows you to glide. Simple. Or maybe you heard a variant of this where it's not pressure melting, but rather frictional melting that creates this lubricating liquid water layer, as the heat of friction melts water under the blade. I mean, this is what the old-timey physicist Michael Faraday thought way back in the mid-1800s. It's what a lot of textbooks teach. In fact, I think I was taught this. It's what a lot of educational videos show, often adding some little demonstration where they'll take like a little thin wire and they'll put some weights on it and they'll show that they can very slowly cut through a thin block of ice through pressure melting. Hell, I even found an interview with Richard Feynman, a famous titan of physics, where he gave this explanation. However, what's so odd about the proliferation and persistence of this idea is that it is so obviously wrong. First of all, at temperatures below negative 20 degrees Celsius, there actually is no liquid water phase at any pressure. Below that temperature, pressure just changes you between different solid phases of ice. So if this was really true, then skating would be impossible in, say, a brisk Canadian winter's day. And as a Canadian, I can say authoritatively, it is not. People skate. I mean, not me personally, I've always been like terrible at skating, but I have seen other people skate on cold days. The second obvious glaring flaw with both the pressure melting and frictional melting explanation is pretty simple. Liquid water is not a very good lubricant. I mean, it's not terrible. There's, I mean, there's a reason we have wet floor signs, but to be a good lubricant, you need to prevent two solid layers from touching one another. And if a fluid flows very easily, which is to say it has a very low viscosity, like water does, then it can't do this, because it will be easily squeezed out the sides and lead to the two solids making direct contact. I mean, think about it. A patch of ice on a sidewalk, it's very slippery. But it's not like you can skate on a sidewalk during a rainstorm, where there is a thin liquid water layer. But according to this explanation, those two situations should be the same. But then, okay, if that isn't how skating works, then how does it work? Well, I mean, check the title of the video. To this day, we really don't fully know. But just last year, there was a paper published in the journal Physical Review X that really shone a light on what's going on. But before we get to that paper, let's just take a minute to understand the actual physical setup of skating. When you skate, you have two solids, the solid ice of the rink and the solid metal blade of your skate. And between these two, you have some kind of lubricating fluid, which we're going to call meltwater. We're calling it that to hint that it may not actually be our old boring friend, liquid water. And as you push forward with your skate, the friction between your skate and the meltwater is going to want to pull the top of the water layer forward. But at the same time, there's also friction between the meltwater and the ice, and the ice is held stationary. So what's a meltwater going to do? It's got two forces pulling it in two different directions. Well, when the top and bottom of an object are experiencing opposite forces, you have what's called a shear stress or shearing force. And if we imagine our meltwater like it was made up of like a bunch of little layers, you're going to find that each layer will take a different speed and is set in motion relative to each other. It's going to flow with a certain shear rate, which is defined as the difference in speed of successive fluid layers. 
And this brings us to the very definition of viscosity. Viscosity is defined as the amount of shear rate you can get in a fluid for a given applied shearing force. It's a measure of how freely and easily layers of fluid can move relative to each other. So something with a low viscosity, like liquid water, can move very easily against other water. So if the bottom part of the water is held stationary by friction with the ice, and the top is forced into motion by its friction with a the skate, then there's no problem. And you, you get quite a bit of flow. On the other hand, for a high viscosity fluid, like honey, let's say, you get very little shear rate for the same applied shearing force. But okay, now that we understand that, let's talk about this Physical Review X paper that was published in November of last year by Canali et al. And it's called Nanorheology of Interfacial Water During Ice Gliding. Now, like a lot of highfalutin words there, but we'll actually come to understand precisely what it means by the end of this video. But in a nutshell, the paper was really about showing off a new kind of experimental probe they created, which they called a stroke probe. And if you're going to show something off, like your cool new toy, what better a proving ground than attacking a centuries-old open problem in physics? Now, I've left a fuller discussion of how this probe works in the video description, but in a nutshell, it's a small tuning fork, like a real music tuning fork, but with a glass bead glued to it, and the glass bead is lowered so that it just makes contact with this meltwater layer on the surface of an ice sample. Then, because this is a tuning fork, it can be driven into oscillation at its resonant frequency, which causes the glass bead to, well, skate back and forth and back and forth over the melt layer, which as the melt water exerts viscous and frictional forces on the bead, it feeds back into how the tuning fork's oscillation is being driven. And by using the known math and physics of flow for a sphere moving through a fluid, and the known math and physics for how a driven harmonic oscillator like the tuning fork responds to having this kind of dragging force on its end, they were able for the first time to measure a number of important properties of this thin meltwater layer. Specifically, they learned three things. The first is that by superimposing a second very small up and down resonant oscillation onto the larger back and forth one, basically exciting an overtone with a tuning fork, they could relate the frictional force experienced by the bead to the downward pushing, or what's called the normal force it was exerting, and thus estimate what's called the coefficient of friction of this thin meltwater layer. And what they found was that at the nanoscale, ice is just a slippery as the macroscopic scale, which is interesting, but maybe not gobsmacking, but it's really more of a confirmation that their new stroke probe they're showing off gives good results in a known case. The second thing they learned is that this meltwater layer is actually only like a few hundred nanometers thick. That's like a hundred times thinner than the width of a human hair. Now if you look at a skating rink after it's seen some use, you'll probably see a fair amount of liquid water on it. Way thicker than like a hundred nanometers. But that's the point. That glistening water you see isn't the lubricant. When you skate, as we discussed, because liquid water has such a low viscosity, that water will just be squeezed out until you make contact with this nano-sized meltwater layer, and that's where the magic happens. But the final and most important thing they learned was that they were able to measure the viscosity of the meltwater as a function of the shear rate. In other words, how does its ease of flow change as a function of how much it's currently flowing? So what did they find? Well, everyday boring ho-hum liquid water is, to an excellent approximation, a so-called Newtonian fluid. And what that means, what a Newtonian fluid is, is one where its viscosity is independent of its flow rate. In other words, on a plot like this, liquid water would just look flat. In a sense, the amount of stickiness a layer of water feels when trying to move relative to another water layer doesn't depend on how fast they're moving. The molecular interactions within water are the same at a slow gingerly laminar flow as they are in a chaotic and turbulent fast-moving stream. But what about with this meltwater? Well, they found that it looked like this. First thing we'll point out is that for all shear rates, the viscosity of meltwater was higher than liquid water. Remember, the low viscosity of water is what made it a bad lubricant. And we see that meltwater has a higher viscosity and is thus a better lubricant. But also, we see that this viscosity changes depending on the shear rate. In other words, meltwater becomes less viscous the faster you get it flowing. 
But how can that be? Well, this brings us back to the title of the paper, and especially to this $10 word, nano rheology. Well, the nano refers to the fact that the meltwater layer is only 100 nanometers thick, and that their probe could resolve the nano scale. But what about rheology? Well, not all fluids are Newtonian like water. Take, for example, mayonnaise, or paint, or oil, or ketchup. These are so-called complex fluids, usually made of a suspension of one thing, like long polymer molecules or small chunks of tomato, suspended in some more liquid thing like water or oil. The study of these complex fluids is called rheology, and by the way, if you're a young, aspiring physicist who's looking for something with some meaty complex math and theory, but also has a strong eye for applications, you might want to check out rheology. Everything from paints to microfluidic cooling circuits and future computing technology to bioimplants. A lot of cool stuff going on. And this field of rheology is very familiar with a fluid that behaves like this meltwater. It's called a pseudoplastic, or shear thinning fluid. The faster it flows, the more easy it flows. A great example of this is ketchup. If you have a squeeze bottle of ketchup and you squeeze it very gently so that the flow rate or shear rate out of the nozzle is very slow, it's very viscous. It holds its shape and it's quite rigid. But if you squeeze quite hard and thus have a high rate of flow, it becomes more liquid. And that's how this meltwater is behaving. Though I should point out that ketchup is actually a little extra interesting than regular shear thinning fluids. And that's because the flow of ketchup has a kind of like short term memory. When you get it flowing very fast and thus it thins and its viscosity reduces, the viscosity doesn't instantly return to normal once you stop squeezing. It persists for a few seconds in a more fluid state before reverting to the, you know, more slow moving sludge. This property is called being thick so Tropic, say that three times fast, and it's why we shake a ketchup bottle before pouring it. Now, to be clear, this work did not find that meltwater is thixotropic, but I went with ketchup as our example because, because it is thixotropic and this thinning persists for a while, it's pretty obvious in everyday life that stress thinning has happened. So bringing this to a close, what this paper showed is that what makes skating possible is that there is a thin nanometer sized layer of meltwater that forms, but this meltwater is a complex stress thinning fluid, more like ketchup or olive oil than regular liquid water. As the authors of the paper put it, it's the slimy meltwater layer of only a few hundred nanometers that makes lubrication and skating possible. But of course, this paper isn't the end of the story. It doesn't answer, for example, what this meltwater layer is actually comprised of, like microscopically. We can guess that it's made of a suspension of like solid ice fragments and grains sliding past each other with liquid water and surface tension acting in between, like other complex fluids in rheology, but we don't really know anything more concrete. It also doesn't answer why or how this layer is forming. They actually did point an infrared thermometer under their glass bead as it skated and realized that there is not actually a lot of frictional heating going on. Instead, they surmised it's more likely that we're seeing some sort of ablative wear, like sandpaper creating a thin layer of dust underneath it, than true frictional heating or pressure melting. But again, that's not fully established. But anyways, happy holidays everyone, and I hope you have a great New Year's. Have a glue vine or age-appropriate beverage on my behalf. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and have a good one.